okay, maybe to start, I can say that Jeremy and myself, you know, we had to, did a PhD, I think, at the same time, but we are both super intensive, so we didn't know each other at all during our PhDs, because Jeremy was doing mathematics, oh, and I was boy. in the dark lab doing my light scattering, and then I think first time we met when we were both, I guess, to both our complete surprises, we were at the same time elected uh, Trinity Research Fellows. And I, I thought I had absolutely no chance to get this fellowship, you know, but I thought if I don't apply, I can never get it. So I thought I must apply. So I don't know how about Jeremy, but in the end, we both got it. And there was a third guy who is, um, um, what's his name again? He, uh, um, uh, 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 both you and, um, what's his name? Yeah, no, it's a long time ago. I'm terrible with names. I can't remember. Yeah. I, I'll remember later. And both you, Jeremy, and him joined Hewlett Packard. And uh, he didn't. He didn't join Hewlett Packard at that time. That's possible. But later on, he he still works. I think at some subsidiary or spin out from Hewlett Packard. No. Um, okay. So Trinity is like we were fellows, and we met many times at the high table and I still remember Jeremy was doing very, very serious discussions about how to start up the Newton Institute in Cambridge for mathematics. And then you started the Institute in Bristol, I think. So why don't you talk a, a little bit, you know, a few minutes about why, you know, for me, it's completely puzzling that you start, that you switch from a very successful pure mathematicians a mathematician to looking at information in cells. You know, there's a logic there. So I'd like to hear the logic from you and not me only, but so maybe okay. tell us your path a little bit and then presentation and Clarice, please, you are in the same field. So uh, let's do it a dialogue awesome. or multi-log. Okay. Um, well, I'm glad you think there's some logic to it. Um, <laughs> there must be. Uh, my trajectory, um, uh, Gerhard, but I, I, I've always struggled to understand the logic behind it myself. Um, so, so, um, so as Gerhard um, uh, said, um, so we, were, <laughs> we, we, we overlapped at Trinity, and I was a pure mathematician, um, uh, a very pure mathematician. And if at what, is, the time, what, what did you study? What did you study in math? I was an, I was an algebraic topologist. Cool. Um, so, um, uh, so, so kind of very core pure mathematics. Um, and at the time, if anyone had said to me, um, Jeremy, one day you're going to be uh, working in a biology department and teaching people biology and doing research in biology, I would have fallen off my chair laughing because it would have been completely sort of ridiculous to have thought that. So um uh if there is any kind of thread i suppose that although i was always very drawn to to pure mathematics for its sort of elegance and structure um i was also very uh, keen on on mathematics having something to do with the world um and so in my first degree i mean i did a lot of fluid mechanics and i, I loved it as a subject but it was devoid of sort of really serious theorems uh, which, you know, that's really what drew me to, to, to pure mathematics. Um, and um, uh, so, so, the, the, so, so the first kind of distraction for me was doing a postdoc in Chicago. I was a Dixon instructor there. And um, it just turned out that the Department of Mathematics was trying to create um, a, a computer science, uh, nucleate a, a computer science program uh, in Chicago. And their idea of how to do that was to hire a bunch of logicians. Uh, and the result of that was that nobody knew how to actually teach any computer science. Um, and so I ended up volunteering to teach the first some of the first computer science classes in Chicago. And I'd been playing with computers since I was a kid. To me, they were just a, a toy. Um, and I had great fun doing this course, uh, programming, basically. Uh, and it made me realize that actually computing was was kind of kind of interesting from a mathematical point of view. And that was the start of this drift out of pure mathematics to Hewlett Packard eventually, where I was interested in using pure mathematics to study computing systems. And I thought that you could use pure mathematics to sort of get to grips with sort of the complexity that's present in, in computing systems, broadly speaking. 
And it took me a long time to understand that computing systems are complicated, but at the time I was dealing with them, they were not really complex. And it was really the genome projects back in 2000. Okay. What do you mean by complex? I'm sorry to interrupt you. You know, no, no, complex no. is, is, a, is a, how do you say, it's a loaded word, not complex. It's a very loaded word, yeah. and it has many exponential. It has, yeah, it has many meanings, but I, I think maybe the example might be the clearer way to, to get at what I'm trying to say um, is the distinction between computing systems and living systems. Um, they both are very complicated, can be very complicated. But I, I would say that the living systems exhibit complexity and the computing system don't. <laughs> um, and it was the genome projects that kind of, for me was the big wake up call, um, partly because it revealed, it opened the door to this, this kind of biological complexity. And it also, uh, and I think for many people, was this kind of sudden realization that biology is, is, is transforming from this wet subject where you had to go into a lab and do things with, you know, wet stuff to a dry subject, which in principle you could do in a computer or in your head. Uh, and of course, for a mathematician, that was a, that was a, that was a tremendous uh, pull. So, so, so this is a complete rationalization of a process that at the time was extremely non-deterministic. So, so go ahead, in answer, a very long winded answer to your question of how I, came to biology. So it was very much an accidental thing. But I think the thread for me, I mean, I, I, I would, I always identify as a mathematician, even though I work in a biology department oh, and do sure. biology. It's, it's, it's not. But in between yeah. you built up this uh, Hewlett Packard lab in, in Bristol, no? Uh, well, I was, I, I yeah. peripherally, I mean, when I was on high table and so on, I heard about it, but I didn't really, and then I moved to Tokyo, so I didn't really understand what you were doing there. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit what you did for with this Bristol lab? Well, so, so um, we... Is that uh, still existing, the Bristol lab? No, not really. I, so the, <coughs> there's a lab, there's a research lab there, but what I was involved in doing was creating a sort of basic research lab as part of that. And this is what involved this collaboration with the Newton Institute that we set up. Oh, okay, but not biology. That's a different. There was no biology at the time. In fact, it, uh, you know, Clarice, one of one of the early areas that we were interested in there was quantum computation, um, and um, and so you know we were partly responsible for recruiting uh, Sandu Papescu to Bristol, and uh, there was a whole group of people uh, around Sandu and and in Cambridge as well. Who were working on sort of early aspects of quantum computing and we were very excited about this because we thought there was sort of technology uh potential for it but uh, but but anyway that's another story and how did you get uh, now you're at harvard medical school so what's your path from bristol to harvard medical school uh well uh okay there was another accident um i i had a lot of contacts in boston and when i got interested in biology um i had the opportunity to come to harvard as a visitor for a couple of years they were setting up a new uh, sort of quantitative biology systems biology program. And they wanted someone to help them, uh, you know, kind of recruit mathematicians and help them understand how maths and physics could interface with biology. Um, and that kind of changed my life because I'd never lived inside a biology environment. Um, and I thought this was just a kind of opportunity for me to learn some biology and then I go back to industry. But, but in fact, everything I, had thought was interesting before I went there turned out to be wrong. Uh, and and in what way? What you what in what way? Um, well, so biology is a very su very surprising discipline to me because um, <coughs> essentially, um, so when you're a mathematician or a physicist, you're accustomed to the idea that. Um, whatever is important in the subject is written down. You know, if, if you do mathematics, you have to write it down, you know. Um, and, um, and from the outside, it looks like biology is the same. You know, you have textbooks, you have papers, you can read them, things are written down. But in fact, one of the things I discovered from that period of immersion in biology is that all the important things in biology are not written down. Uh, that in fact, they are acquired, absorbed, 
by being inside a biological environment through a process of apprenticeship. You learn it by doing experiments, by, by acquiring the culture of being an experimental biologist. Can you um, give us some examples of what you mean? Um, yeah, I mean, if you, take, if, you, if you take any paper that you read in the journal, broadly speaking, the paper says, you know, uh, we did that to these cells and the cells did that to us. You know, I mean, I, of course I'm caricaturing it, but that's broadly speaking, the structure of a lot of papers. Um, and, and what the paper will never say is, uh, well, why did you do that? Um, and why did, you, uh, why did you do it in that way? Um, why did you choose to interpret what the cells did in the way that you did? Um, all of these questions are part of the culture of whatever field of biology that paper is part of. They are known to the participants. Uh, they are unstated for the most part. Um, it's often quite difficult if you're an outsider to actually answer those questions because sometimes the people working in these fields are not so aware of them. It's almost like you have to do a kind of psychoanalysis on them in order to, and, and a historical analysis to trace back how it is that that field ended up making these kind of guiding assumptions, which have then set the path of research over many, many years, sometimes decades, um, to uh, go in a particular direction. Um, so, um, uh, one could be more specific about sort of particular things, but I think it's very broadly true of of most areas but like in of experimental physics it's also you know i mean i i don't know the experimental part of biology i haven't done experimental biology but you mentioned it in this paper no? that to, in 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 the paper in the nature in your most recent nature paper which you sent me you wrote that doing nature a, paper um, nature. There's a paper in proceedings of the IEEE. Oh, IEEE, I'm sorry, IEEE, I mixed it up. IEEE, the, the paper you sent me. No? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> at some point in the paper, you write that doing experiments on cells is very puzzling because the cells kind of fight back. <laughs> is that what you mean? Um, that's that's <laughs> certainly true. I, I think that's <coughs> not a perspective that people tend to articulate very clearly when, you know, they take a very instrumental view of how, um, how experiments get done in cell biology. But I think the more thoughtful cell biologists recognize the fact that cells are living organisms and therefore they are responding to the stimuli that one uh, uh, imposes upon them. And, and they're not, you know, kind of molecules. <laughs> uh, and, and so that's quite related to this theme about learning, because I think um, um, I think for me one of the things that's attractive uh, 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 about this notion of learning is that um, it gives us a way to think about cells, not just as sort of collections of molecules interacting with each other, which has been the sort of primary um, sort of uh, um, sort of metaphor, if you like, that we've been uh, employing over the last twenty or thirty years, uh, very successfully. Um, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it goes beyond that to, to suggest that these collections of, of molecules are capable of a sort of agency. They, they are agents, they have autonomy, they have the ability to construct internal models of their external environments. And, and that's, that's more than just being a collection of molecules. Um, which, which you probably mean that there is information processing. Exactly. Is that your point? Okay. That's very much the point, yeah. But it's information processing of a, of a particular uh, of a particular kind. I mean, there's all sorts of forms of information processing. And if you say cells process information, biologists would say, yeah, of course they do. You know, they get signals from the outside, they transduce the information, they do stuff. Um, to say that they learn, I think, is to say something over and above that. Um, and I think particularly this idea that learning involves the construction of sort of internal representations of the external world, that they're internal models. Um, and I think that's a, that's a very tantalizing idea. I think um, the nature of those internal models remains very puzzling. Um, and, um, and, and I think for me, that's one of the sort of exciting things that we personally are, are interested in, yeah. Um, so, um, so uh, 
So I, mean, I, I, I kind of lost track of, of uh, the question that Gerhard was, was posing. I was asking you how you got from Bristol to... Uh, yeah, to, well, so... so, to, so, to, so, uh, so Harvard, okay. to the medical school. Yeah, so, 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 so I had this opportunity to go and learn some biology in Harvard um, as a visitor. And it kind of changed my life because, as I said, I realized that uh, biology from the inside is very different from biology from the outside. So, so I learned two things. One is the, the point I made about everything that's important not being written down, which means you really have to be inside biology to understand biology. And second, that um, if you really want to have an impact on how biologists think, then somebody has to do an experiment. And, and again, for someone brought up as a mathematician, this is kind of a very foreign, this is a very, very difficult thing to take on board because, um, uh, you know, I, I'm not an experimentalist. So I realized that if I was going to really take biology seriously, I would, you know, somebody had to do an experiment. And I didn't, I, I was coming to the field of you know, completely from, you know, outside. So I hadn't developed any collaborations or anything like that. So I actually realized that if I was serious, I would have to do experiments. Um, and, and so that was, the, that was the second big shock. <laughs> uh, and then one of these other accidents um, occurred that... Oh, well, that's um, Clarice and me, that's our life. I mean... I, yes, well, you are experimentally, so this is not a surprise, but, you know, I'm a pure mathematician for crying out loud, you know? This was, like, extremely scary. Um, but um, at the time I was, um, I was a visitor, it happened... Um, so I was a visitor in the main part of... Harvard and the undergraduate campus. Uh, but at the time, the medical school was going through a sort of exercise to decide, you know, the next 20, 30 years of what they should be doing. And they decided that they were going to create a department of systems biology. Um, and Mark Kirshner, who was the then chair of the cell biology department, had been persuaded to take on this task of building this new department. And um, I got to know Mark, and Mark basically um, offered me a job. Um, and actually this was, this was kind of really interesting from a kind of anthropological perspective because um, uh, this, would, this would never have happened in England, right? Or, or in Europe. Um, and, and this was sort of quintessentially a sort of American phenomenon. Um, and I remember, you know, having this conversation with Mark and I had, I was trying to explain to him uh, that I needed to, I, I felt I needed to do experiments. And I was terrified because I knew that if I had this conversation with, with anyone in head of department in England, I would have been told, oh, Jeremy, don't be ridiculous. You know, go and have a, an aspirin and, 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 and sleep it off. You know, you, you're a pure mathematician. You can't do experiments. So I was going through this big spiel about how, uh, how I felt it was really important to, to, to do this in order to really so get to grips with biology. And Mark was looking more and more puzzled. You know, I could see that I was sort of saying things that he was finding, you know, kind of weird and strange. And so I sort of rambled on for about 10 minutes. And at the end of the day, I stopped and said, well, you know, I, I think I need to do experiments. And he just looked at me and said, so what's stopping you? Okay. And, and this was something quintessentially American. You know, it was the, you really want to do this? Well, go for it. You know, there's, there's, you know, whereas in England, you know, if I'd said this, it would be, don't be ridiculous. You don't have the background. You don't have the experience. It will be very difficult. Nobody's done that before. There's no money. All of these reasons why you can't do something. So, you know, I, all I can say is it was incredibly lucky. I was there at that time. And uh, Mark was this amazing leader and uh, creator of sort of scientific, uh, wonderful scientific environments. And if it hadn't been for that, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do anything. So Gerhard, you know, uh, that's what I'm saying. It was all a series of accidents. You know, Venki Ra Ma Ramakrishnan, uh, he, uh, we had a Zoom call with him. You know Venki Ramakrishnan? Yes, I know him. And he wrote a book also about his path. No? Oh, and yeah. he started as a physicist and he switched from physics to biology. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, I mean, switching from physics to biology is different than from maths to biology. There's, a, there's, there's, some a long, there's a long tradition, right? The early molecular biologists, Francis Crick, all of those guys, Seymour Benzer, yeah, Wally Gilbert, but they were all physicists. Max Delbruck. But there's your, your story now reminds me a bit about Venki. Mm. So now next thing you have to do is win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> Oh yeah. No. <laughs> so, so, so Jeremy, how how was it learning biology, and what are some strategies that you can? I mean, I, I'm there. You're on the same path, no? I, I I'm on the same path, and uh, it is it's. <laughs> I've I've been encountering more <laughs> difficulties. I hear people say, "Well, you have no background in biology. Well, there's no money." I I do get those those really? like I. I and and the question is like how do i learn biology and how do i there's a part to that that maybe you could comment you know like uh i i have um you um jeremy you probably know rob phillips right from of course. caltech of course so uh you know sometimes what rob phillips does is he says like the problem with biology is like the theory is at plot 6 in the paper it's yes, never yes. plot one. He has, a, he has a lovely paper on figure figure yes. one versus figure seven. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah, that, that's it. What's so, his so, so, name? What's the name? Rob Phillips at Caltech. Uh, Rob Phillips at Caltech. Okay. So t tell us more about theory in biology and maybe like how you how you go learning biology, how you go about like talking to biologists about the importance of predictive models, right? Not only like modeling what happens after the fact, you take a picture and maybe you, you, you model something after using the videos and stuff, but by to, to have predictive models that you can like take an experiment to check whether the model is valid or not. And I like a mathematical model, I mean, I think this is one of the things that, that I find it the hardest to try to, to convey to biologists maybe yeah. is that your your yeah how do you feel about those things yeah no it, um i think it's a continuing struggle um clarice uh, and i don't think that um, um i don't think there's a real resolution of it in the field and the literature um uh so i think um each of us who sort of comes to the, to biology from these other routes i think uh, encounters, you know, um, a sort of tends to encounter a unique set of difficulties in, in confronting that. <clears throat> Part of that, I think, has to do with the importance of the environment that one is working in. I'm very conscious of that because I think I was extremely lucky in the environment that I happened to find myself in at Harvard in a department of systems biology because, you know, it took years before we published our first experimental paper. And along the way, we made the most hideous <laughs> mistakes uh, as a form of learning. Um, and the nice thing about my department was that um, it, um, when Mark Kirshner, my department chair said, you know, so what's stopping you? It wasn't just words and it wasn't just sort of the support, financial support to, to do things. It was the moral support to do things. So, you know, I would go to him and I'd say, Mark, you know, this thing just isn't working and, you know, he and many colleagues, Tim Mitchison, others in the department, Luke Huntley, very, very experienced biologists, would, um, you know, were unstinting in terms of the time they gave to help uh, and, uh, and, and guide the work. Um, and, and they didn't treat me as stupid. I think that was the thing I appreciated most of all. That, you know, stupid, this, this is one, one point, is not treating you as stupid, yeah? Exactly. In, in, that's only one point. Because in many systems in the world, right, in many countries, different countries have different academic systems yeah, and research systems. But in many countries, uh, it's not an issue of treating you as stupid, but it's an issue of treating you as their slave. Do you know what I mean? Yep. They, they yeah. are their systems. I won't name any countries now because yeah. I don't want to get into <laughs> trouble. But there are some countries where 
the general way of doing things is that if you would come into that country in the situation you had at that point, you would not be just treated as stupid, but in addition to that, you would be treated as a slave. Yeah. And you would never be where you are now in such a system. Yeah. And that's why and, and I think in the US and not in one of these other countries, which I won't yeah, make. I, I think there's an element of that that persists even in in um, the system that we're in, in that um, um, biology is in this state of being extremely data rich. And, and in fact, the rate at which data is produced is increasing. So it's not just data rich, it's Sure, sure. So, I mean, that's also why you have a value, uh, one of your ways you have a value as a mathematician. Huh? Yeah, but, but, but as Clarice was saying, it's kind of always kind of, it's not quite the slave relationship, but it's always, you know, the experimentalist has the data and then it's the job of the mathematician to analyze the data. And that's fine, but it means that, um, you as a mathematician don't have an opportunity to, to develop the conceptual um, paradigm that determines what kind of data you should be uh, accessing. Um, and I think to come back to the question that Clarice was asking, I, I think that's this, that's a sort of issue of the balance. I think there's what we see now is a lot of what Rob Phillips would call the sort of figure seven model, right? I mean, the experimentalists do a whole bunch of experiments. These are figures one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then at the end, in order to, you know, sort of get the paper into a high impact journal, they have, you know, a tame mathematician or two construct a model and it fits the data. And this, this, this is nice. And, and now this is very common in, in experimental papers to see the use of a model. And, and what Rob and I and a few other people have been sort of arguing about is that, you know, there is a real need for this to sort of flip around. And for theory, uh, meaning, you know, a kind of our ability to sort of uh, to articulate the conceptual landscape, to guide the kind of questions and the kind of data that are acquired in a way that's perhaps a bit more similar to what we see in physics, where, you know, physics has gone through that transition. If you go back to the times of Brahe and Kepler, it was data driven. And, and somewhere in the middle of the 19th century, you know, it became theory driven. Um, and, uh, and, and, and biology is still in the Keplerian mode. Um, uh, and, and so I think the challenge for those of us who are theorists is, is how we develop conceptual paradigms that are powerful enough to articulate compelling new questions for biologists to address. Uh, and, and I think a part of it, you know, it would be nice if biologists were more open to that. Some of them are, most of them aren't. But I think the onus is on us to, to show that theory can be used in this way to do biology in a, in a more insightful way. And I think you can see that, you know, again, biology is a huge subject. And if you go to neuroscience, then neuroscience has had, has had theory for a long time. Um, and, 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 and theoretical concerns drive the way in which neuroscientists think about the functioning of the brain. Um, so, so, so the balance between theory and experiment is in a very different place in neuroscience. Um, but if we come back into sort of more conventional parts of, of biology, um, immunology say, or, uh, or even aspects of physiology, then the balance is, is cell biology. The balance is very different. Um, so, so Clarice, you were asking about what, how one tackles this problem of getting to grips with biology, and I, I don't think there's a yep. there's a set answer. I think it is very dependent on one's environment. I personally, um, you know, I think being embedded in, with biology, you you know, somehow you kind of absorb things subliminally by the environment that one you're in. Um, but uh, in a more structured way, I found that I found it really essential when I'm told things by biologists to try to unravel the historical, the historical um, um, uh, trajectory uh, through which those ideas emerge. Uh, 
Um, and for me, I was not brought up as a historian. I, you know, history was a very boring subject when I was at school, so I paid no attention to it. It was all, you know, kings and queens of England, and who wants to know that? Um, but I've become much, much, much more sensitive to, to history as a result of coming to biology, um, because it's provided a, a way to, to understand that question as to why is it that biologists now, today, in this world, are thinking the way they are. Uh, and, and what's curious is that the biologists themselves are often unaware of their own historical development. It's a very unhistorical subject. What's important is what's happening today. You know, it's very much driven by this sort of modernist conception that, you know, history is bunk. Um, and as an outsider, all I can say is history is not bunk. History is the one of the few ways that I've been able to actually understand the present. So, you know, for me, that's been very useful. Uh, very insightful. Thank you. I think you prepared a presentation. Why don't you, if you like? I, 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 Gerhard, I'm happy to, but I, you know, I'm, I'm also happy to just, uh, you know, sort of talk a little bit. Maybe I could show you a few things. If and, you show, might... show your presentation and then uh, we can, uh, Clarice and... Oh, I, you know, we can stop at any time and, yeah. and diverge or... Great, great. You know. We have any time. I mean, I don't know what your schedule is, but from my point of view, no, no limit. And... Um, uh, yeah, I, I think for me, I, I probably have to stop at about three uh, UK time. So oh, I don't know what your time is. <laughs> okay, sorry. So it's uh, it's about ten to two by my watch. I think. Yeah. Oh, okay, a bit more than an hour or so. Okay, uh, yeah, that's perfect. Good, good, yeah. good. Uh, if you go through your presentation and then we can interrupt or we can have discussion afterwards. And uh, absolutely, what, whatever, right. whatever uh, looks interesting. And 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 please, if there's anything that's obscure and or anything that you want to sort of just Great, unwrap, good. just ask. Good, me. good. Right. Let me see if I can find these. What I was doing here. Um, okay. So, can everyone see that? Yep. Okay. Good. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So. Um, um, okay. So. Um, I, I, I was going to sort of uh, start off with a little bit of an admission that um, what I'm going to talk about is really not kind of what we uh, sort of have mostly been doing. Uh, I do have a day job, I suppose, is what I really meant to say. Um, and um, the, the day job involves, um, you know, thinking about various forms of, of information processing, mostly in, in well, exclusively in, in eukaryotic cells, mostly mammalian cells. We don't think about bacteria. Um, and um, uh, we do that by focusing on molecular mechanisms. Um, uh, Post-translational modification of proteins is something that's always intrigued me because it's a way in which um, proteins acquire an enormous amount of potential molecular state. Um, and I've been very curious uh, for a long time about uh, how that's being used from an evolutionary perspective. Um, uh, we're also very interested in gene regulation, um, and um, uh, and these are um, uh, rather different kinds of um, molecular mechanisms. Um, Post-translational modif modification is un unfortunately still rather inaccessible experimentally, um, so um, uh, it's hard to get access to protein state in individual cells. I mean, the best we can do is is squash a million cells and, and use something like mass spectrometry to, to detect protein state. And that's averaging over a lot of information that we would really like to get our hands on. Um, the situation is much better for gene regulation. We have experimental techniques now that we can observe the expression of an individual gene inside an individual cell in real time. Um, so there's potentially much more data available in the context of gene regulation. Um, and um, uh, we've also devoted a lot of effort to developing some of the mathematical and biophysical foundations for understanding molecular systems of this kind. Um, and I won't go into this um, other than to just flash this slide up uh, in front of you and to reassure you that, you know, I do actually have a day job. <laughs> 
Um, but um, more recently, um, as Gerhard mentioned, um, uh, we've um, I, I've been very much drawn towards this new direction, um, uh, which has to do with the question of whether individual cells have the capability to learn uh, and uh, what aspects of cognition they might be undertaking. Um, and this is a, um, a perspective piece that just uh, came out in the proceedings of the IEEE where um, I sort of um, uh, lay out some of the arguments for why this is an interesting question. Um, and this is the sort of background for the things I wanted to talk about today. Um, uh, and this, um, this, this comes out of a, um, a collaboration that um, began, I guess, pretty much just before the pandemic hit us uh, with a colleague at Harvard, uh, Sam Gershman, uh, who's a, a computational cognitive neuroscientist um, uh, in um, um, the Department of Psychology. And um, uh, we've um, written a, another perspective piece on, again, uh, why this question of learning in single cells is ripe for reconsideration. Um, and if I unwrap um, this story one more, um, one more layer, um, it goes back to a, to a sort of skunk works project in my lab. And, and I, I wasn't going to say much about this, but perhaps I should pause and, and, and tell you a little bit about the history of this, because this is a sort of origin story for me. Um, so um, many years ago, um, shortly after I came to biology, I was back in Cambridge. Um, and I listened to a lecture by Dennis Bray. Some of you may know of him. Uh, he's a very famous biochemist. Um, and um, during the course of this lecture, he flashed up a slide in which um, he basically showed this picture that you see in the bottom right here um, and mentioned the work of a biologist whose name I'd never heard of, um, Herbert Spencer Jennings, um, who had shown that um, a single-celled organism, uh, an organism called a ciliate, um, so-called because they have um, uh, little hairs that you can just see in this picture, uh, which um, they, um, they rotate in order to create um, uh, vortices in the fluid, which they use to move um, and to, um, uh, and, and to, uh, to eat. Um, and um, this particular ciliate, Stentor roselli, Jennings reported, uh, which, um, which tends to anchor to a substrate and then uses its cilia to create a, a vortex that brings bacteria to this oral cavity um, that you can see uh, in, this, uh, in this slide. Um, so keep in mind, this is a single cell. Right? Um, it's quite a big single cell. It's about a millimeter. So it's, you can see it with the naked eye for a big cell. Um, and what Jennings reported was that if he, if he kept um, irritating the cell by squirting carmine dye at it, then it would go through um, a sequence of avoidance behaviors. Um, and they're represented in this, in this little picture here. To begin with, it would sort of bend away to sort of avoid the stream of particles. Um, and if that didn't work, uh, it, would, um, it would reverse the direction of the cilia around the oral cavity. The, the effect of that is instead of the vortex in the fluid bringing particles into the oral cavity, it pushes things out of the oral cavity. Okay, so ciliary alteration. Um, and if that didn't work um, and you kept on irritating it, then it would exhibit this um, very rapid contraction. So it's a trumpet-shaped organism that sort of extends out into the fluid. Um, and it can contract extremely rapidly onto its holdfast. Um, and if you do nothing, it stays that way, and then it will gradually reemerge. And if you keep stimulating, it'll keep contracting. But if you do that often enough, it will get really fed up and tear up its hole fast and swim away. Okay? So this is Jennings' avoidance hierarchy. Um, and I remember when I was listening to Dennis uh, tell this story, I was just entranced because I thought, hang on, this is a single cell. How is it capable of doing all this amazing sequence of different behaviors? 
right? It's not just that it's doing one thing, it's doing, it's changing, it's, as it were, changing its mind as it, what it does. It's doing more and more elaborate things to get away from this irritation. So this was extraordinary. And, um, and, and it struck many people as extraordinary and it's still reported in the literature. Uh, I, I have a question, J first. Jeremy. Is, is, yeah. is, the, is the surprising here that it has memory? Or is it surprising because like all the different, cor correct me if I'm wrong, I have no, <laughs> so, so because uh, all those, couldn't those different behaviors be explained chemically? For sure, uh, absolutely, because um, you have, um, uh, it's not it's not difficult to imagine that there's some kind of little program inside that's saying, well, you know, if you if you see this same irritation a certain number of times, then stop and do something else, right? I mean, so you could certainly imagine that that could be implemented by biochemical means. We have no idea how it is done, I have to say, but you could imagine that it could be done. Um, I think the the surprise is that a single cell would be capable of these behaviors because most of the single cells that we deal with, which tend to be, you know, cells from mammals, mostly just sit in a dish and do very little. Um, and I would say that this is the most complicated set of behaviors that's been observed in any single cell. Um, you know, you can irritate single cells, they'll do all sorts of things, they'll move around, they'll change shape, um, you know, they'll secrete things, they'll do all sorts of stuff, but this um, sequence of different behaviors changing its mind, as it were, I don't think that's not been reported for any other kind of cell that we know of. Cool, thank you. So, yeah, so um, I, I absolutely agree that, you know, to a physicist, it's not hard to imagine that you could implement this um, in, a, in molecular terms, but we have absolutely no idea of how it is done. Okay, so um, so 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 I, so I was um, I was kind of thrilled by this, um, and I started doing some digging. I read Jennings's papers, um, and I started asking around among people who sort of work on learning in organisms other than you know kind of human beings. And I was I was flabbergasted because I was told, oh, James's experiments are not reproducible. Okay, um, you know he, it was a, it was an artifact. Uh, and I was, I remember to this day, you know, when I got this email from a very respected, you know, person who had worked on similar organisms, very good experimentalist, and I got this message, and I said, oh, I was, I was sort of so disappointed. Um, but it kept bugging me because there was something kind of, I didn't, I, you know, I read Jennings' his papers, and I, you know, the papers, he's a brilliant experimentalist. And I, there was something odd about this. So in the end, uh, I actually went to the library. I had to go to the library because this paper that claimed it was not reproducible wasn't available electronically. And I, I went in the depths of the Cantway Library, photocopied this thing. I hadn't done this in years, right? You know, actually go to a library and photocopy an article and read it. And, you know, it was the worst piece of experimental work I have ever read in my life, okay? Um, I mean, apart from anything else, I mean, there are many, many things that were bad about this. But here's the thing, uh, Jennings worked on uh, this organism, Stentor roselli. And Stentor roselli is, um, is typically sessile. It anchors to algae and it feeds. Turns out they couldn't find Stentor roselli. And, and that's actually a thing because finding it is difficult. So they chose a different organism, Stentor cerealis instead, which is very like Stentor roselli, except that it is typically motile. In other words, it, it does anchor to the foul fast, but mostly it swims around. And what they did, they tried reproducing this experiment. And as they say in the article, it basically just swam away. Okay. Um, and, and the paper is sort of, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's a bad starting point and it gets worse after that. Um, and I was, you know, sort of, I was completely shocked because as far as I was concerned, this was definitely not um, uh, compelling evidence that Jennings's work could be reproduced, uh, could not be reproduced. Um, so from that moment onwards, I, um, I kind of would bug people in my lab um, about, um, you know, we really ought to go back and try um, doing these experiments again. And you know, this went down like 
a lead balloon because uh, the people who come to the lab, you know, they're young, they want to do molecular biology, they want to do cell biology, they want to do all this stuff with molecules. And here I was suggesting that we go and irritate ciliates. It's like doing 19th century natural history under a microscope. And nobody, I mean, you know, they got fed up with me talking about this and they just say, oh, Jeremy, don't be stupid. Who wants to go and do a silly experiment like this? Anyway, in the end, two crazy people came to the lab, I mean, crazy in the right sense, who actually thought this was fun. And they, they, you know, so uh, long story short, it took us many years because we couldn't find the right stentor and we had to, we had no money for this. So it had to be done, you know, uh, with, you know, stuff that we could put together off the shelf. Um, and in the end, we did it. Uh, and, and now it's published. All the videos are out there. You can go and see. And Jennings was right. There is this avoidance hierarchy. And, um, and it taught me two things uh, about this. One, um, that this field of learning turns out to be extremely ideological, okay? So, so, so the only way I could interpret what I had been told about this Jennings's experiments not being reproducible um, is that at the time, which is the 1970s, the community of people who are working on this uh, problem they really didn't want to believe that single cells were capable of this kind of complex behavior. And they preferred to trust a shoddy uh, paper, a bad paper that said the right thing to many good papers that said the wrong thing. Okay. And, and to me, this was, a, this was really a kind of shock because I thought, hang on, that's not the way science is supposed to work, right? Um, but actually, that, that is how science works. And it particularly works that way in biology. And learning is full of these kind of ideological minefields where people claim, oh, that's not possible. You know, human beings are the only things that have theory of mind. I mean, I'm just quoting one of many examples. It turns out that's wrong. You know, chimpanzees have theory of mind. It's just not as elaborate as the ones that human beings have. Um, so people are always making these kinds of, you know, apparently scientifically grounded statements about what the capabilities of organisms other than human beings are. Uh, and and men, much of the time that is grounded on an ideological belief, not on a scientific belief. And to me, this was a kind of shock. Um, and the, the other thing that I realized is that it's really, you know, I, again, as an outsider coming to biology, you tend to think of science as being this, you know, kind of unified way of studying the world. Um, and it really isn't. Um, it's a collection of, you know, kind of different, you know, it's almost like different countries, you know, kind of jostling to study things from very different cultural perspectives. Um, and the people who study learning from the point of view of organisms um, for people who work on cells, they don't even think in those terms. Their whole cultural perspective is wrong. So sometimes you can't even take the same, you can, the same word is used in completely different ways in these different cultural contexts. Or there's the same thing being discussed, but people use different names for it, so they don't even know they're talking about the same thing. So um, this, this problem of transdisciplinarity um, became really acute uh, when trying to get to grips with this 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 work here, um, so 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 for me this was a this this was a very important starting point for for thinking about learning, and it was it was kind of puzzle to begin with. It was just a sort of bug that wouldn't go away, but ultimately it became something real, uh, and it really opened up this question of well maybe this is just the tip of the iceberg. Maybe maybe in fact single cells are capable of doing much more elaborate things, maybe we just have to adopt a different perspective to think about them. So, um, so, so that, was, um, uh, that, that was really the starting point for, for, for much of this. Um, so um, guys, I, I don't know what um, would be most useful here. Um, you know, I can I can go on a bit further uh, and uh, tell you a little bit about um, you know the sort of uh, 
more about the details uh, sure. of learning. Right. This has been sort of background, um, but you know, I'm happy to to you know kind of go off at a tangent if that's that's more interesting. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, Great. So. Uh, so, so, so I think it might be helpful to, you know, kind of step back a little. So I haven't sort of said what is learning. Uh, I will do, but but I think we all have a sort of intuitive idea of what it means to be learn to, to learn, um, and I and I think a, a convenient sort of um, temporary definition um, uh, would be to say that it's a it's a, a somewhat persistent change in behaviour in response to the same stimulus. And, and, and I think if we go back to the behavior of Stentor Roselli and the avoidance hierarchy, we can see that that implies uh, uh, learning. Um, but we'll, we'll unwrap it a bit further. Um, but, but I wanted to sort of just step back and, and, and discuss why, why it's interesting scientifically to, to think about learning. Okay, and I, I, I tried to sort of distill out these, these four points here, which, we can perhaps discuss a bit. Um, so, so, so one one thing is that it cuts across the notion of learning cuts across a vast amount of biology, um, and what we what we recognise in biology <coughs> is that organisms are so different. They have all these <coughs> excuse me very different phenotypes and behaviours, um, and there are very few sort of universal phenomena that we can come across in biology. DNA is, is a universal phenomena. The cell theory is a universal aspect of biology. Um, and I would argue that, um, that learning may turn out to be another one of these universal aspects of biology. Um, and, and I think to me, that's one of the attractions for, for trying to, um, to take this, this path that we're doing here. Okay. Um, uh, another a thing that I think is very important is that I'm sure you're very familiar from from sort of daily discussions in newspapers uh, about this nature versus nurture debate, you know, and and we often find newspaper articles about you know um, uh, 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 about one or the other kind of um, uh, side of this uh, of this debate. And and personally, I've always been struck by this as being one of the stupidest arguments in biology, because it's, it's not that biological systems are nature or nurture. It's always that these two processes are integrated with each other. Um, and the thing about learning is that it is fundamentally an integrated perspective. You cannot separate out the mechanism of learning, which may well be something that is inherited, from the content of learning, which is something that comes to the organism from outside. Okay, so that's the nurture aspect of it. So it, it's a way of, of really avoiding this very, very stupid discussion about whether things are nature or nurture. Um, now, um, one, of the, one of the things that um, has been true of the last sort of um, 20 or so years of, of modern biology since the genome projects um, is that we've, we've developed this very sort of molecular understanding of how biology works. It's a sort of very mechanism-based viewpoint. Um, we, we have uh, uh, a knowledge of a lot of the molecular components that, that make up biology. Um, and um, you might ask, well, is that it? Is that, is that what constitutes an explanation of, of biological sort of phenomena? Um, and the ethologist, Nico Timbergen, um, who received the Nobel Prize for his work on animal behavior with Conrad Lorenz and Carl von Frisch, um, uh, wrote a very influential uh, paper in which he articulated the uh, perspective that for a complete understanding of, of biology, we have to uh, operate in, in four different sort of spaces, one of which is the space of mechanism, okay? But he articulated three others. One is the functional perspective, which as an ethologist, uh, an animal behaviorist, that was the one that um, you come to most immediately because you study the sort of behavior of an animal at a functional level. There's the developmental perspective. How does the 
function emerge over the course of the uh, organism's development from, a, say, a, a, an egg. And then there's the evolutionary perspective. How does that uh, behavior emerge over evolutionary time? So, so that framework, which uh, I think makes uh, you know, very good sense, has, has tended to sort of, uh, sort of fall out of biological memory as a result of the sort of enormous success of the molecular revolution. Um, and I think to me, what's interesting about learning is that it's a way for us who have been mired in the molecular details to, to lift our heads up from that and to take a more functional perspective on behavior. Um, and, I, and I think it's time that we did that. So, 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 so this is um, a strategy for, for, for uh, moving into one of the other spaces that Tinbergen um, articulated for us. Um, and in the context of neuroscience, uh, David Marr, uh, also fellow at Trinity and uh, a famous uh, uh, compatriot, um, uh, in his um, fundamental book on vision, um, articulated a, a, a sort of rather similar perspective to, um, to Tim Bergen's, but coming now from computer science, th this idea that one should actually um, uh, have levels of description. Um, he was thinking particularly about the brain and neuroscience. Um, uh, one description was the functional description that, um, that corresponds, I think, in some ways to, to Tim Bergen's idea of functionality. Um, but from, from Mars perspective, he was thinking of this more as the sort of computer scientist view of function. Um, and then uh, an intermediate uh, level of description, which is that of the algorithm, the algorithm that implements that function. And then finally, the, the sort of implementation level in terms of how is that algorithm implemented in whatever hardware happens to be uh, available to the system. So, so this is very much a computer science centric view. Um, but, but here too, I think um, we can think about learning very much uh, in, in this in this context, because we can see that a particular form of learning may be implemented through many different algorithms and then ultimately implemented in very different hardware solutions in terms of biology. Um, and then I think there's one last point, which I, I, I sort of mentioned earlier on when we were, we were talking, um, and it has to do with, um, uh, if you like, um, the kind of philosophy we have about biological systems uh, at the moment. Um, and, I, and I would say the, the, the kind of, the, the sort of guiding metaphor of, of systems biology um, since the genome projects, you know, we have all these molecular um, components is that we tend to think in terms of machines. Um, and, and we use the machine metaphor. So we have particular kinds of machines like clocks. There's the circadian clock. Uh, we have the cell cycle oscillator. Uh, we have metabolic networks. Uh, and more recently, of course, the, the, compu the computer has become part of the metaphor. We think of that, the, the computational metaphor, particularly in the context of the development of the organism as a form of, of programming. Um, and, and, and we know that, of course, the computational metaphor is very powerful. You can have computers that can be programmed to learn, but that's not been incorporated within this machine-centric view. The computation that's done during development is thought to be uh, a processing of the information in the genome. It's not the processing of the information that's coming from outside the genome. And, and that's the bit that, that's, that's where the learning becomes important. So as I was saying, the, for me, one of the attractions of learning here is that it offers this a new metaphor for thinking about how cells work, um, which is of a machine that has agency and autonomy it's through this ability to extract information from its environment and construct internal models of its environment. And I, I'm still confused about this point, like, how, how do you define agency here? Why is agency more than um, the effective implementation of a program? Um, 
I haven't defined agency, and I think it would require some care to do that. Um, I think that to me, a machine that utilizes an internal representation of the external world and uses that to guide its behavior, that to me would be an instance of agency, the possession of an internal model and its, and its causal effectiveness in guiding behavior is a form of agency. I think there could be other forms of agency. Um, uh, uh, and I think uh, you could imagine that the internal representation could take the form of some kind of program. I'm, I'm here, I'm being Catholic with respect to the sort of nature of the implementation of the representation. Yeah, right. Um, but, um, um, but, but the kinds of representations I suppose I have in my mind are those that are perhaps closer to biochemistry and the kinds of molecular processes that we see in cell cells. Okay, so, um, uh, so, 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 so that's, um, that, that's one of the reasons why I think this, this particular direction is, uh, uh, is an interesting one to, to, uh, to take. Um, okay, so um, uh, maybe we could, um, uh, get into uh, a little bit more uh, detail about um, uh, about about what learning is, um, and um, uh, I think if we start from um, the context of, um, of 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 sort of psychology and cognitive science, which are the domains in which learning was first studied from a scientific point of view, um, and this is still the sort of um, if you like the sort of the, the sort of core understanding of learning comes from those disciplines. Um, then um, uh, the, the early psychologists uh, were able to sort of characterize uh, certain simple kinds of behavior in a, in a very experimentally well understood way. And these have been the basis for studies of learning in many, many different contexts and organisms since then. And I think this will probably be familiar to you. Um, we can make a distinction, for instance, between so-called non-associative learning, which, which is learning in response to the same stimulus that's repeatedly applied. Um, and, and two sort of complementary forms of, um, of response to repeated application of the same stimulus are what is called habituation on the one hand, where the response decreases steadily over time. Often it's an exponential decrease, but not always. Uh, and the sort of complementary behavior in which the response increases over time, which is sensitization. And both habituation and sensitization are very broadly observed across the animal kingdom under very different conditions. <clears throat> very different kinds of stimuli, very different kinds of responses, very different kinds of contexts. Um, but, and, and this clearly satisfies the condition of, you know, it's a persistent change of behavior in response to the same stimulus. Persistent here meaning over a time scale longer than that of the repetition time of the stimulus. Um, but it's relatively simple because it's just a single stimulus. Um, of course, the more interesting case is what happens when there's more than one stimulus. And now we get into this famous uh, uh, cases of, of uh, associative learning, um, uh, which again, I'm sure you'd be very familiar with, uh, the, the idea of conditioning or classical conditioning or Pavlovian conditioning, which goes back to Ivan Pavlov, um, which is uh, goes back to his famous experiment on dogs. Uh, Pavlov, in fact, you know, won his Nobel Prize for his studies of, of, um, of physiology and, and gastric physiology. And during the course of these experiments, he was doing experiments on dogs. And he happened to, to notice the fact that, you know, when you, when you present a dog with food, it will salivate. Uh, and it just so happened that um, in the, his very, very kind of uh, elaborate lab that he had in St. Petersburg, it happened that there, a bell was rung at the, just before the dogs were given their food. Um, and, um, and this was just an accident. It just happened to be uh, at that time. 
And, and he noticed that on one occasion when the food was late, the dog salivated in response to the bell, even though the food was not present. And he was smart enough to realize that something very, he had observed something very, very important. Um, and this was the starting point for his studies of Pavlovian conditioning. Uh, and of course, this is, he's much better known for this work than he was for the work that won him his Nobel Prize. Um, so this, this, is, uh, this is this idea that if, um, if uh, uh, you have this involuntary response of, uh, of salivating um, and you receive a cue, which is typically a neutral cue, just a, a bell or a light or something else, um, that happens just before uh, you are due to receive what would elicit the uh, involuntary response, you learn to associate them and you no longer need the food to, to. So this is classical conditioning. And somewhat later, um, Burroughs Skinner, um, uh, who is one of the founders of behavioral psychology, um, uh, developed uh, something that all parents know. Uh, it, it's gone, given, you know, sort of grand names like operant conditioning and instrumental conditioning, but it's basically trial and error learning. You know, if your child does the right thing, you reward them. If your child does the wrong thing, you, you tend to tell them off. Um, and, and this very simple procedure called reinforcement learning uh, is extraordinarily successful at, uh, at teaching animals to do things now which are not instinctual, like salivation, but things they may never have done before. And if you haven't seen the videos of Skinner's pigeons playing ping pong, then I strongly recommend looking this up on the web because uh, you know, they're very good at it. Um, and, um, and it's an indication of how powerful this form of, of learning can be. So, um, so, so these studies in, 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 uh, in psychology were the sort of starting point for the sort of scientific uh, uh, study of learning. And um, they created this view, particularly with associative learning, that what was important here for learning was the, um, was the association in time between the stimuli. Uh, and, and, and if this was repeated, then you, you learnt that association in time. Um, and this was this was uh, this was uh, this was very nice because it seemed to be very consistent with what neuroscientists found about how neurons were behaving, um, and um, it's uh, the basis of um, uh, uh, you know um, uh, uh, what's called Hebbian learning in among neurons, uh, named after Donald Hebb who articulated in the following way, uh, neurons that fire together, wire together. So you're familiar with the fact that uh, neurons have synapses on other neurons. Um, and if um, the presynaptic neuron fires, sends off a spike slightly before the postsynaptic neuron fires, then that tends to strengthen the synapse between them. And this is called long-term potentiation. In fact, um, it's quite symmetric because if it happens the other way around, if the postsynaptic neuron fires before the presynaptic neuron, it reduces the strength of the interaction. That's long-term depression. Um, and together, these constitute what's called spike timing dependent plasticity. It's a way in which the strength of the synaptic interactions is altered depending on the relative uh, timing of the firing of the neurons which are linked by that synapse. And what's the analogy for that, say, in the center, in single cell? Is like neurotransmitters flying back and forth? Or Yeah, so there have been um, uh, attempts to study conditioning of multiple stimuli in, uh, in stentor. The literature is very murky. Um, uh, there is at least one very good study that we believe is, was carried out well, but it hasn't been replicated. We have actually tried, but it turns out to be quite tricky experimentally for all sorts of other reasons. Um, but um, Stento is interesting because um, the, uh, the ciliary uh, beating and is organized electrophysiologically. So it actually has an action potential. <laughs> um, 
So, so the, in fact, um, uh, species of, uh, of ciliates are sometimes called swimming neurons because they exhibit many of the neurophysiological uh, capabilities of actual neurons. I mean, they're completely far apart, right? 500 million years separate them, evolutionarily speaking. But they have many shared components of uh, um, uh, um, uh, iron channels, all sorts of other things in common. Um, so it is quite conceivable that something similar at the molecular level could be occurring. Um, but again, there hasn't been a sort of definite and compelling study of that. Yeah. So cool. Thank you. Okay, so um, so it, it did seem to be that there was a, a, a good story coming together about the sort of behavioral level of associations in time and the neuronal level of what's happening with synapses. Uh, and, and it's still the case that many neuroscientists believe that this form of uh, spike time independent plasticity underlies learning and memory. And it's certainly implicated in learning and memory for sure. However, part of the cognitive revolution that uh, took over from behaviorism um, uh, reveals something which actually has still not been internalized in parts of psychology and in parts of neuroscience. Um, and, um, and that's the realization that learning is not the formation of associations in time. In fact, association in time is neither necessary nor sufficient for learning to occur. Um, and I won't unwrap this. There's a lot of beautiful work. Um, Robert Rascola was one of those who was responsible for, for much of it. Um, I think the work is absolutely um, compelling. It's been reproduced many times. One of the, one of, to my mind, one of the most significant distinctions is that in the neuroscience context, when you look at spike time independent plasticity, there is actually a very narrow window of about 50 milliseconds where you need, where the spiking of one neuron has to be uh, close in time to the spiking of the other neuron. If it's beyond that, it just doesn't, there's no, there's no change in the synapse. So there's a hard threshold at the neuroscience level. When you look at the behavioral level, there is no threshold you can learn over very long intervals, provided you have enough stimulation at that, at that rate. So, so, so that's a, one of the many signs that what's going on at the learning level, at the behavioral level, is not actually to do with, with timing of, of associations. So, um, so, 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 so it's not about the formation of associations. And, and what has emerged from the cognitive revolution it is a view of learning which uh, is much more about information processing. Um, and I've tried to extricate from that what I think of as the sort of key aspects of it. I would say this is sort of a provisional definition. I think it captures you know, some of the aspects of it. I don't think it necessarily gets to the entire heart of it. Um, but what is attractive about this is that it kind of frees us from this kind of experimental paradigm of what's going on with, you know, conditioning and, uh, and the kind of context of, of organisms, and it's treating it really as a form of information processing, which is something that could be carried out by a machine, let alone by a single cell. So, so this, this is what sort of extricates it from this psychological and cognitive context to a context of information processing. So the two criteria which I think are needed um, is first of all, that there's an increase of mutual information between system states and external states over time. And I think that's very plausible that there has to be some transfer of information from outside to inside in order for things to learn. But I think the second uh, point is also very important that there is the formation of some internal representation, an internal model of this external information that is used to causally guide the behavior of the of this of the system. Um, and, uh, and, and over a period of time when the external information may no, no, may no longer be present. So, so I think these are um, to, this, this is the kind of uh, definition of learning that I believe we should adopt uh, at least provisionally for studies of single cells. Um, 
Um, and, I, and I would just point out that, you know, this is when we talk about mutual inference, we, we talk about something that is very well defined from a, from a mathematical point of view. This is Shannon mutual information, it's mutual entropy. It can be defined, we can measure it. Um, uh, uh, but but it, it's allied to this to this I think more elusive question of the internal representation. So 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 I would say that one way to think about this is that the so it's really um, it's really an anti-behaviorist definition, right? Because be, behaviorism was characterized by this view that the only thing that matters are the stimuli and the responses. That what goes on inside the organism is a black box. Uh, you know, you're not allowed to say what goes on inside there because it's meta metaphysical and we can't get our hands on it, right? And, and now we're in a world where we can get our hands on it. And, and, uh, and, and indeed, this, this is part of what constitutes learning. We have to understand the internal representations. So it's in that sense that this is an anti-behaviorist definition of, of learning. Um, I, 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 so may, maybe I, I will go back to... I am sorry um, to this point because uh, since I'm talking to physicists, I think perhaps they might appreciate this point. Um, uh, so, 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 so when we when I was thinking about how to define learning from an information processing perspective, it was the first definition, this idea of mutual information increasing, that struck me as being kind of you know well obviously you have to have that, and the question was is that sufficient. Um, and, and I think the answer has to be no, because imagine what would happen if you had a physical system that was being driven by its environment uh, in, a, in a purely physical way. Then you would imagine that actually the internal states of the system uh, would begin to, to couple with the external states, that you would get increase of mutual information over time. Um, and, and that was just a sort of, you know, kind of intuitive thought. Um, but in fact, this very interesting paper from, from Gavin Crookes, some of you may have known about the Crookes uh, theorem in non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, um, which is already, you know, now 10 years old, um, on the thermodynamics of prediction actually goes further than that. And, and shows that there's actually a very interesting relationship between the ability, when you force a system, the internal states acquiring predictive capability of future states and the dissipation of energy. So, 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 so there's a very fundamental thermodynamic connection between uh, the ability to predict future states and, and thermodynamics. And, and, that's, um, and that's what this paper uh, lays out here. Um, and, and, and for us, this is particularly interesting because this kind of relates back to our day job <laughs> of trying to understand the sort of biophysical foundations of what goes on at the molecular level. Um, and we, we, we're, we're very, interested in, in pursuing that direction of, of trying to understand what goes on. Now, what's missing here is that the driving, the kind of driving that they define here does not create a kind of a proper internal representation. Um, and so, but it's an interesting question about whether physical systems, I wonder whether physical systems can have memory. Maybe there are physical systems that can construct internal representations. If so, what form would they take? And would that constitute learning? And how would we distinguish that from the learning that an organism undertakes? So this is why I say this definition is a little provisional. And I'd love to talk to physicists who are thinking about sort of smart materials and other kinds of phenomena like this to see if there's some way that we could get a mathematical handle on the character of these representations that might be forming. Okay. Uh, and, and you know, this is where you start to wonder, you know, what's the difference between a mechanical system and a and a living system? After after all, living systems of at the end of the day, they're just molecules at some level, right? So we believe there isn't a ghost in the machine. So 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 um, so so maybe 
maybe what we would think of as purely physical unliving systems are actually capable of more learning from this point of view than we might recognize, in which case maybe we need to, to, to define biological learning a little bit more sharply than I've done here. Uh, uh, Jeremy, I mean, when I, I haven't read this paper, so I'm, I'm just, I just downloaded it from Fisher of Leather, so I have to read it later, but it will take a long time to understand that. No? Yeah, but, no, it's, 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 it's a very interesting paper, but it's not easy to read. I, it will take a while to understand, so I have to see if I can find the time to do that. But one thing which immediately shoots into my mind when I see, you know, just uh, or superficially, is reversibility, you know, immediately mm -hmm. comes to my mind. No? Uh, when you talk about thermodynamics and information, and I mean, prediction is related to information. So then the issue is always, is that a reversible process or not, you know? And right. I'm sure you know this Feynman papers about uh, Feynman's work about computation, which then leads to co quantum computation. And uh, the one very important issue there is the reversibility of uh, computation. Of no? and, and they're very fundamental papers of Landauer and people like that. Exactly, the, exactly, exactly. Yeah, how is that related to the thermodynamics of prediction? Uh, so one of the things that they do is to, uh, in this paper, is to provide a more refined statement of uh, one of Landauer's inequalities. Ah, it re okay. So I have to read the other paper. I have to read that. Um, um, so, 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 I <coughs> so I think this is very interesting. And um, even in the in the limited context that, that that they're looking at, it's a sort of Markov chain argument here that their, their systems are basically Markov chains that have been forced. Um, but uh, e even in that uh, in that uh, in that limited context, um, the uh, the observation that um, uh, you know there is an exact relationship between the predictive capability of the internal states and the level of dissipation coming from the forcing. I think that's, that to my mind was really kind of startling that there would be this uh, uh, such, a, such a close tie up between what you would regard as purely a learning phenomenon of the prediction capability and a, a purely thermodynamic capability, the, 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 the dissipation. Um, so, um, so, so I think there's much more to do here. And it's curious that since this 2012 paper, there hasn't really been a, a lot of follow-up to, to, to this that we've been able to see in, in, in the literature. It sort of went out there and um, I don't know that people have understood how to, to, to build on it. And I, th and I think taking learning more seriously is perhaps one way to, to open up that and to discuss the thermodynamics of learning in a, in a, in a, in a, in a better way. Um, to, so, so what I what I what I find particularly interesting about this is whether one can push this further to understand uh, the nature of the internal representations, because because it seems to me that there are many different kinds of internal representations that could be utilized by cells and by organisms. Um, uh, we can think of internal representations as forms of memory. They're very different forms of memory. I mean, we have sort of computer memory where you, you, know, you know, have explicit operations for retrieving and, and erasing and, and uh, memory, but you have, you know, kind of uh, uh, memory in the form of sort of DNA, DNA, you know, persistently encodes information, right? So it's a, it's a very different kind of memory. So is there some principled way to argue about the sort of thermodynamic requirements of different kinds of memory? That, that, that would be the, the, um, the, the way to, to, to sort of state the question. And I, and I think this is sort of saying, well, you know, in, in principle, this is a starting point for that kind of discussion. Um, so, um, so, so this is both a way to say that um, uh, we need the two uh, aspects of the definition of learning I gave. It's not just sufficient to look at increase of mutual information because purely physical systems can exhibit that. You also need the internal representation. It may be that physical systems also are capable of internal representation, but that is less clear. Um, and I'd love to, to, to know more about that. Um, but if we, um, uh, if we step back a little bit, um, maybe I, I, can, um, I, I can introduce a sort of another, um, uh, another direction to just sort of think about here. Um, 
so, so, so this notion of representation and internal representation of or memory, if you like, uh, to me is one of the very key ideas here. Um, we, of course, are, are sort of approaching it from the sort of molecular perspective, um, but but it's a it's a it's a key issue from the um, cognitive and neuroscientific perspective. Uh, because we're all familiar with the fact that, um, you know, we have persistent memory. We uh, are able to encode the memories of a lifetime. Um, so, so somehow uh, in that mush that we call the brain, uh, there are structures which are encoding information over decades. Um, and, and the nature of those representations, which are called engrams, um, is basically unknown. We, we do not know what the, what the <laughs> physical substrate of memory is. Uh, we know that there are many components that seem to be implicated in this. We mentioned the synapses. They're clearly implicated because if you learn, you see persistent changes in synapses. If you, if you, if you disturb those synaptic connections, then you, know, you, you, you don't exhibit uh, the memories that you, you, you had. Um, and, and neuroscience, um, a lot of neuroscience kind of, you know, is kind of happy with that. They say synapses, that's it. But in fact, there's been a lot of new research that has taken the question of memory and the engram, the nature of the engram in two kind of opposing directions. One direction has been the recognition that the engram is not just uh, localized at synapses, it's also distributed among ensembles of neurons. So it's possible to go through, you know, very sophisticated experiments where you, you, uh, you train a mouse uh, and you do some incredible molecular biological wizardry, which uh, tells you which neurons uh, have become activated during the learning, and you can reactivate those neurons optogenetically. Uh, and by reactivating an appropriate ensemble of neurons in particular brain areas, you can, as it were, uh, bring the memory back. So, so memory seem to be related to ensembles of neurons. So, so one direction in which the engram question has gone is towards looking at these kind of populations of neurons, sparse populations of neurons in, in different brain areas. But there's I mean, different... Sorry, go for it. No, no, go ahead, Clarice. So, so you're, you're talking here about memory as like memory stored in the brain, right? But should the information be stored epigenetically? That could explain a lot of like memory for behavior in cells or memory for, for other processes too, right? It doesn't need to be restricted to neurons. Or... Absolutely. And uh, that's really what I'm trying to point out on this, on this slide here. Um, so, uh, so, so I was saying that, you know, there's this sort of ensemble perspective about the engram, but, but, but neuroscientists have always also discovered something else, uh, which is going in the other direction, which is that <coughs> when learning takes place and there are synaptic changes in a neuron, there are also major changes in gene regulation within that neuron. Um, and, and these gene regulatory changes are often persistent over very long periods of, of time, sort of of the same time scale as long-term memory. Now, that's extremely interesting because as you pointed out, Clarice, um, there is there's a sort of another form of memory that we have in, in, in biology. Uh, we sometimes don't use the word memory for it, but it is a memory. Um, and it's the uh, memory that uh, emerges during the course of development because as uh, the organism is developing from a single cell, cells become more and more specified as to their ultimate fate as say a neuron or a liver cell or a skin cell or whatever. And um, as they go through that lineage choice, they remember what kind of cell they're going to be. And that memory is in inherited by their daughter cells. Um, and, and when they get terminally differentiated, they become a liver cell and they basically remember that they're a liver cell for the lifetime of the organism, unless they're 
loss to injury or, uh, or, or some other form of disease or cancer or something like that. Um, so, so there's another form of memory that takes place in biology, which is this, this kind of developmental memory. It's also on the timescale of the organism. Um, and, it's, uh, and it turns out that when you look under the hood, um, the, the same kinds of genes are involved, the same kind of epigenetic changes are involved as are involved in neurons during, during learning in neurons. So we have these two parallel processes of memory. One is the cognitive memory and the other is the developmental memory. They're functionally both memories over the timescale of the organism. And at the molecular level, they involve fundamentally the same molecules. And are there more memory types, not memory for cell state, not memory for like real memory? I remember Inform this, information, but... yeah. So that's a very good question. Uh, there's certainly different kinds of cognitive memory and they're mostly can be understood from, from different perspectives. Um, there's certainly an issue of sort of the time scale of which memories are maintained. So we have sort of short term, intermediate term, long term, and we're all familiar with this from our own selves. And when we read things, we remember them the next day, sometimes we remember them the next week, and some of them we remember the next year, but not always. Um, but there's more, I think, interesting distinctions between different kinds of memory. For instance, there's uh, declarative memories, there's um, memories for facts, uh, my name, you know, um, the capital city of England. Um, there's memory for uh, events, so-called episodic memory. So we have a memory of uh, uh, being at high table with Gerhard, uh, you know, so many years ago, and, you know. And, and Jeremy, I was maybe more thinking about uh memory of biochemical processes like in the sense you know yeah. in the sense in the adaptation sense that you think about stentors or yeah yeah so i think we have much less idea um, of what functionally distinct kinds of memory might exist there i think there are there are signs certainly of a distinction between a short-term memory and a long-term memory. And if I had to be very coarse, make a very coarse guess, I would say that it's likely that the short-term memories involve molecular changes that are taking place within the cytoplasm, maybe through things like post-translational modification. And I think long-term memories, if they are taking place, are probably more likely to be associated with changes in gene regulation in the nucleus. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think Very we cool. do see okay. at, at, the, at the cellular level, there are, is experimental evidence of a distinction between the short term and the long term. I, I don't know whether we have, I, I don't think there's any uh, good uh, way at the moment of characterizing different kinds of memories like declarative versus episodic memory for instance, oh. but it's not because I would rule that out from being possible. It's just that we haven't been smart enough to sort of, you know, kind of make those kinds of distinctions. Yeah. Um, but but I, 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 I would certainly imagine that there is a, a distinction between uh, things that are mostly taking place in the cytoplasm and have a relatively short time scale of maybe an hour sort of to things that are maybe taking place inside the nucleus and have um, you know, days, if not longer, of duration. Can I interrupt for a second? I have two questions. Please go ahead. Number one question is the following. Uh, memory is one thing, like uh, like the, my memories of when we met uh, 30 years ago, when how long that ago that yeah. is, huh? that's one way of memory. Huh? And uh, or the other way of memory is when I learn something, let's say uh, at the moment, I'm learning a lot about quantum computing, for example. No? And so learning exactly, uh, actually trying to act uh, or working hard to absorb knowledge which already exists. No? But then the other thing is creating something which nobody has thought before. You know, <laughs> so during my research, I had some of them I followed up, some I didn't follow up. You know, I have these ideas which come under the shower or something, you know, which is something, oh, why don't I try this and that, you know? Mm 
<clears throat> or like Einstein creating the theory of relativity, you know, mm -hmm. creating something which never existed before, which mm -hmm. is, it's not really learning, you know, it's, it's no. a creative process, creating a creative something, process. Yeah. something uh, uh, in a way abstract, the eye in the head, you know, which is a new thing. No? And uh, so did you cover that or not? No. No, uh, and, and I think you're absolutely right. That's a fundamentally different process. Uh, I mean, it might give rise to memory, but, but, but it seems to be fundamentally a different process. Um, I think we're, we're, we're aware of it as human beings that, um, that, uh, that there's a form of creativity. Um, I think there is evidence of some kind of um, ability to create new solutions to problems that you see in the animal kingdom. Um, you know, with experiments that have been done on various kinds of animals that, that have this ability to, to find completely novel solutions to, to problems that are presented. Um, now, um, if you were to ask whether that's a capability that individual cells possess, you know, I, I, would, I would hesitate to go that far myself. Um, but, um, I, I, I think part of the difficulty would be how would you formulate the right kind of experiment to do that? For that, yeah. Yeah, well, try do an experiment on Einstein's brain, brain or something like that. Uh, the other question which I have, which is probably quite fundamentally related to that, is one issue which I got quite interested in since about two years ago is sleep, you know? Mm which is very badly understood. Well, not yeah. badly understood, but there's a lot of open questions, you know? Mm -hmm. And I organized this Boltzmann forum and I organized, I, I invited the top uh, expert on sleep in, in Japan to talk about sleep. And uh, I, I read quite a bit about sleep. And uh, 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 even I think algae, you know, fairly compared to humans and, and elephants and so on, you know, uh, fairly, uh, how do you say, lower level, it's maybe a wrong word to use, but, you know, more simpler, yep. simpler yeah. levels of life show indications of sleep mm -hmm. or, or like birds, birds fly. No? So if mm -hmm. they would start to sleep, they would drop out of the sky and die. So the birds, what they do is, they have a status where they shut one eye and half the brain is asleep, you know, and they oh. they can continue to fly. I was so surprised. Oh, is that right? I didn't know that. How fascinating. Yeah, it, sleep is absolutely amazing. Yeah. It sound it look and the, when you sleep, actually the brain is hyperactive and seems to have a very important role in uh, transferring information no, no, no. between different uh, parts of the brain and organizing and reorganizing and creating new, new connections, you know? So have you thought about sleep in terms of your research? Uh, because... that's, a wonder, that's a wonderful question, Gerhard. And, and, <laughs> it, um... it seems to be so fundamental sleep, you know? It yeah. might be a factor in your work. Um, so, 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 so the way I would, begin to think about that is that um, so one of the universal features uh, one of the few universal features of life is that all essentially all cells run a circadian clock yeah so that's all, they're, they're related all, of course to of course. the yeah. issue of sleep. and and that, that's an example of you know evolutionarily learning the you know kind of planetary um, uh, dynamics um, and um, I didn't know that cells have a circadian clock. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I just like... want to say bye, bye real quick. I have to go. Uh, 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 okay. I have to. Thank you so much. We, we'll Clarice, talk soon. It's so nice to see you. And we must talk again. We, and... we must talk. I, I, I will invite you to, to, to like the same seminar series to, to, to which I must hop out of now. It's our quantum biology meetings. But thank you so much. Sorry for interrupting the, 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 the conversation about sleep. Maybe we should cut this interruption from the... <laughs> we'll talk about Sorry. the quantum, quantum sleep. Uh, it was, it was so lovely to, to see you. <laughs> Oh, go. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for joining, Thank Clarice, you. and see you soon. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so, so all cells basically run a circadian clock. So, so even if they are not, so, so um, what that usually means is that, you know, 
either in the nighttime or the daytime, depending on what the ecological. Where is that is. located in the cell? I mean, is the nucleus is doing that, or or? Yeah, um, it's it's usually done through gene regulation. There are particular proteins that are upregulated on a sort of oh. twenty-four, roughly twenty-four hour cycle. Yeah, um, and. Um, uh, uh, usually what happens is that there are sort of major changes in sort of metabolism of the of the cell, uh, depending on, you know, its ecological context and whether it's sort of nighttime or daytime, roughly speaking. Yeah. yeah. So even if the if the organisms are not sleeping, they are kind of aware of that it's a different period. And it's quite possible that the nature of their biochemistry and their processing is different during that time. This is like an early developmental stage of what later becomes really. Yes, yeah, becomes, becomes proper sleep, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, yeah it's, so, it's, so it's a, it's a it's great a question. question. It's a great question. And, and um, uh, it's one of those things that we haven't sort of really studied, but it might turn out to be something that's actually quite relevant. You know, if we're doing experiments on single cells, it might be actually relevant whether we do them sort of in the day, in their day or their nighttime, for instance, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. This is, comes back to your issue of you know, working on cells that kind of uh, you have to do what they want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, how is your time? I don't want to run over. Yeah, yet. it's three o'clock now, and I unfortunately we've actually got to to drive up to Cambridge today. I oh, really, um, yeah. Um, uh, fortunately, we, not unfortunately. Fortunately, well, no, it, it's it's very nice, but um, uh, it means that we we must leave soon. So let's I, I, uh, bring that to conclusion now, if you like. That would be that would be very nice, and and. Um, I hope um, you know at least there's a little bit of you know kind of background and 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 information there. So uh, this was fantastic, very very fantastic. Um, it's uh, if you want to join our programs in the future, will be fantastic. Well, the I'm next... on the, I'm on, I, I'm on the mailing list. I, I listened to Clarice and I listened to uh, Dominic uh, Levin. Um, both oh, of them were amazing. fascinating in their different ways. The next one will I... actually be the new vice master, Louis yeah. Menret. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so I'll certainly join when I have an opportunity, um, uh, Gerhard. It's it's great fun. It's nice to uh, you know, there's such interesting people, and it's always nice to sort of catch up with old friends. Uh, your talk was amazing. I was keeping no when I didn't look into the camera. I was taking notes and downloading the references, and uh, it's, I'm very very interested in this uh, thermodynamics of of yeah of yeah. No, I thought I thought you would be. Um, this is very. So, I, I, yeah, no, so we're, we're also very curious about this and hoping to do some work on it. So I'm sure we'll have more discussion in the future. Now we are back in contact. Thank yeah, you so no, much. Lovely. And I'll upload this onto uh, YouTube and you can <laughs> watch it and uh, send out the references and so on. Very good. Okay, Gehan. Well, listen, it's been lovely to, to see you and um, uh, thank you for hosting this. I know it's a lot of work to organize these no, things. No, no, no. It? Uh, you have much more work. You, you, put, you, you did all the work. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Take care. And take Great care. to see you. Good, uh, good drive. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah.